a lot of people have been have told me about the famous story of Hannes being gored by a buffalo, and uh, including Don Price mentioned this in one of our conversations. You got to get Hannes to tell you the story about when he was gored by a buffalo, <laughs> um, and and so I've I've twisted his arm. I'm very he's always very reluctant to talk about himself, but uh, Hannes. The, the stage is yours. Welcome. <laughs> Tell us the story. <laughs> well, John, one of the reasons why um, I, don't, I don't particularly like talking about it is because I suppose um, what I'm about to tell you was an exercise in, 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 in gross incompetence. <laughs> I'm, I'm the guy that um, can probably teach people how not to hunt buffalo. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, it goes back, it was uh, 1994, July, yeah, July, I think. And I was hunting up in northern Tanzania, um, an area south of Arusha, um, on the Simanjiro Plains there. And uh, quite tough buffalo hunting country because the buffalo there, are, have a hard time. It's it's dry, and they live mainly in these thickets along what the, the Karongas, these dry river river beds, and the Maasai give them a hard time. Um, quite a lot of poaching, and then of course there was us. We were we were there hunt, hunting buffalo in that in that area. So there were there've been there were quite a few incidents before me, and there've been quite a few subsequently. In that in that area, but I um, I was actually finished. I'd finished my my last safari, and I was quite looking forward to heading back to Arusha for some time off and to go and drink some beer and play around. <laughs> and my my great friend Andy Wilkinson, who I was hunting with, got sick. He got some gastric thing, and he was bloody ill. Um. And he, there was no way he could, he could go out. And he had some new clients in. And so he was manned down. And so I was, I had to step into the breach to, to uh, take care of Andy's guys. I wasn't terribly pleased about it. I've got to be, got to be honest. As, as I say, I, I don't know if I wanted to go and have some time off. But um, off we went um, with a chap by the name of Paul Hicks. Uh, this was like his second or third day in Africa. And we were off to hunt buffalo. I think I did say to Paul, you know, we need to get this right. These things aren't um, to be messed around with. Anyway, cut a long story short, we got out that afternoon and uh, saw... So it was just the one bull. It was getting late in the afternoon, and he did. He came out of the thicket, um, and I managed to get Paul up reasonably close. Uh, we had a shooting stick here. There's 375, if I remember correctly, with a scope on it. And um, I remember the buffalo looking at us head on, and I, and I, and I said to Paul, don't um, just wait for him to turn side on because the full frontal into the brisket is a very tricky shot. Um, far safer with the animal at right angles. And then it's, the target into the shoulder opens up and um, it's a killer shot and normally works. Anyway, I... I hope I've got this right, um, if I remember correctly. But uh, Paul, I could see he was he was excited, which is understandable, and he fired early. And I had a bad feeling um, right there and then that that shot was probably not in the right place, and uh, we might have a problem on our hands. Incidentally, I had actually just the safari before. I'd had a, a wounded buffalo in one of these Karongas. And uh, I managed to pull off, I think 
one of the luckiest, best shots in my entire life because this thing came for me from the high ground. And somehow I managed to brain him and stop him in his tracks. I've still got some photographs of that buffalo, I think. Um, so I, I, I just had one quite narrow encounter, quite, quite dangerous encounter, and I wasn't looking forward to trying to pull that off again. So I, was, I, wasn't, I was not thrilled about um, another wounded animal anyway. We found the tracks, found a little bit of blood, but with that kind of shot, that's the other problem. Uh, there wasn't an exit wound and the bullet had gone in somewhere around the shoulder, but it, it, it wasn't fatal and there was very little blood. And so tracking was difficult because um, a blood spore helps enormously um, and also because there's, there are other tracks in, in those areas and it's very hard to figure out which is the wounded animal and which, which isn't. So it was, it was quite hard going in and, out, in, 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 in and out the thicket. And I think that afternoon I did actually see this animal, but I wasn't sure it was the wounded one. And it was frustrating because I tried to get closer to, to try and establish whether it was the wounded animal. And um, I was unable to, and I just heard this crashing through the, through the thicket. And that was the end of it. It was, it was now dark and, um, well, getting dark. And we just had to um, call it a day. It was, uh, it was a Sunday, uh, now I remember. Uh, I'll tell you why. So we went back to camp um, and uh, I just said to Paul, we'll have to come back in the, in the morning and, and pick up the tracks and, and try again. So night back at camp. But what was uh, memorable about this was um, in those days, we had our shortwave transistor radios to listen to the news and um, anything you know that was going on in the world. And I always liked to listen to um, what you know what the BBC. I had to say, um, as much as I disliked the BBC, it was the only news service that we really could could get in those days. And so I had my shortwave radio, and um, I got up in the morning. It was still dark, and I switched on to hear the news. And on the sports section, they reported that um, my great friend, Nick Price, had won the British Open. Um, and it was just a, just an amazing sort of sequence of events, thinking, you know, I'd known Nick for a long time. There he was winning the British Open. And I uh, thought, here I am, now I've got to go and look for a for a wounded buffalo, you know, life's not always fair. <laughs> and I, um, but I actually wrote that in my in my diary. And anyway, um, off we went. I said, I said to Paul, you know, Paul, you don't have to come along on this bloody thing. This you know, can be dangerous. And uh, so, if you want to stay behind, um, no hard no hard feelings at all. Um, Anyway, he, our Paul, to his great credit, said no, he wanted to come along. So off we went, and um, I'll try and cut this all short, because we got onto tracks first light, I suppose it was, and um, I had my, my, my tracker, Maraji, wonderful bloke, who looked after me for many years in Tanzania. We had lots of laughs, and um, we, uh, we started following this thing, and hell, it was hard going. Uh, and then the sun came up and we were making progress, but it was slow and frustrating because a couple of times, I think we flushed him and the wind, as, as, as the day grew hotter, the wind started swirling. And that's really tough when you're trying to get close to an animal because if you've got the wind coming up behind you, they know you're coming and very, very difficult to bring matters to a head. So I was getting frustrated. I just becoming a little bit reckless, I think, but frustrated. I'm, I moved ahead. Uh, there was a point where I, I knew that the, the thicket was, was thinning. And 
he wasn't out in the open area and I consciously I thought I could flush flush him and and all, it's all I wanted was to put it, get a shot into this animal and and try and put him out of his out of his misery you know I, I, I could point out to my credit um I didn't have to keep going because I, I tried pretty hard uh, you know a lot of people might have just said oh, forget about it but I, I didn't like to do that and um, I think most of my generation of hunters were a similar mind we we did try very hard to make sure we didn't leave wounded animals out in the field and um, I was determined to try and find this find this this animal. Um, anyway, I did flush him, but I didn't get a shot. It was all too quick and the bush was too thick. And I remember he, he ran out and I took off after him. And I was hoping he would stop in the open, as they often do, and, and, and give me a shot uh, to put into him. But he didn't. He just, he just he ran out and then back into the thicket and I just charged off after him um, at all possible speed and I thought I'm just going to run in and I'm going to just charge onto this. I'm going to find this guy. But I got, it, it was almost like a bad dream really. I got back into that thicket and the thorn was just, was just, uh, it was like barbed wire around me. It was like trying to get through a barbed wire fence. I just couldn't make get through this stuff. I was tearing myself to, uh, to pieces. Eventually, I got down on my belly and I crawled uh, through now to try and get to where I had a pretty good idea he was. And um, I lost valuable time, really, I suppose. And I had only really just got through to where I into a sort of opening. And the next thing there was a crash and he he came at me. I, I, initially I was looking away. It was the noise that alerted me and um, he hit me. I, I didn't even get a shot off. I, and I got hit in the hip here. And the power is uh, very difficult to describe, but I don't like being hit by a tank. Um, and he just hit me and I and I just flew. And I went airborne. And I swear to God, there was a time when I was aloft. When I looked down, I actually thought, geez, I could get a shot off here. And and it, it did occur to me, this guy's so pissed off, you're not going to kill him from where you are now. And I hit the ground and I lost my rifle. And then he was on top of me. And uh, the next thing, I was pretty much impaled um, on, he got a horn through my groin up behind my pelvis, or in front of my pelvis, I suppose. And he was just shaking me around like I was just like a rag doll. And I remember I was all over the place and I remember my mouth filling up with, with sand as I, my head went into the into the ground. Um, yeah, that was just, uh, uh, you know, just a complete and utter helplessness. And then he actually flipped his head and flipped me over, right over him. And I landed on his back. And it was the most amazing feeling. I mean, suddenly I was riding this thing face down. And I did, I actually remember reaching for the, a tuft of hair above his tail, thinking, geez, I'll try and hang on to this damn thing. Let's <laughs> stay here where he can't get a horn into me. But he he knocked me off there. And I remember going airborne again. It sounds incredible, but I I I think I was I was in the air when he got a um a horn into my bicep here and ripped this bicep off and that uh, I just remember blood in my bloody face and looking down and uh, geez, now my arm, I could just see this muscle uh, hanging off, off my arm here. I wasn't, I wasn't 
you know, didn't, didn't look good. And then I was, I hit the ground and he came circled around. And I just remember seeing his head uh, right up next, next to mine and thinking, this is it. And he was about to give me the coup de grace. I was going to get a horn in my head or in my neck when a shot fired. <coughs> and I don't know if that shot actually hit him, but it was Paul Hicks who'd um, come to my rescue. And uh, Paul, that shot definitely saved my life. I tell you, and it was just a split second uh, in time. A, a second or two later, I think I was, I was tickets off to the great beer hall in the sky. Boy. <laughs> but um, he fired, and then he fired another one, and that definitely hit him. And I remember he staggered away, and then Paul came in closer and actually brained him, shot him in the, in the, right in the brain. But at this time, the buffalo had come back onto me. So when he brained him, the whole bloody thing fell on, dropped on top of me. So I was, I was lying there with this, with a, I don't know, 2,000 pounds of damn buffalo. But this thing, I was stone dead, and he's right on top of me. So I was feeling very, very sorry for myself indeed. Um, and I was in a lot of pain. So yeah, I was lying, I was lying there absolutely helpless uh, under this buffalo. And um, there was poor old, Paul, looking at, uh, I mean, as I say, I think this was his second, I don't know, Paul hadn't been in, in Africa for long, and there he was having to deal with some idiot who's busy dying from a bloody, from a, a good goring. I actually felt really sorry for, for him, um, but I was in in terrible pain, uh, whew, suddenly it kicked in and I put my hand down. I managed to get my hand down and um, into this, I felt this bloody hole and, and then I thought, geez, I can feel my, my uh, femur. And so I thought, well, that's it, man. I'm, I'm done. This thing's ruptured my art, femoral artery and, uh, I'm, I'm out of here. So uh, I asked Paul to um, contact my mom and uh, asked him to send a message to my, to my wife, Mandy. We weren't married then. Um, and I gave him a few phone numbers and he, and he said, um, do you mind if I say a prayer? And I, I'm not terribly religious, but um, I said, yeah, you know, thanks. And so uh, he, he said a few words and I closed my eyes and I, you know, I thought I was pretty sure that was, you know, I would lose consciousness very quickly and it would all be over. And it was quite, it was almost <laughs> embarrassing. But um, he finished his little prayer and opened my eyes and I was still alive and I didn't really know what the hell was going on. <laughs> You're being a bit bloody over dramatic. But I really did think I was tickets. Anyway, now uh, I think, geez, okay, I'm, something's going my way and maybe I've got a chance. But my poor old, old Maraji, you know, this, he thought I was dead, my tracker. And so did the game scout. And um, they don't like to be around people who are dying. You know, there's a spiritual thing. So old Miraji, he took off into the jungle. And uh, so I had to now raise my voice and shout. And he heard my voice. And then he, he came running. Poor bloke. I mean, he's, an, he's a black man. <laughs> You're still trapped underneath the buffalo, right? Yeah, yeah, still, still stuck. 
And now Marenzi arrives and he is not looking good, boy. He's white as he got a lot of that black blackness had faded. He's looking white. <laughs> I said, Marenzi, get this bloody thing off me. And um, then Jonathan, I think this game, his name's Jonathan, I think. He then came and uh, they managed to roll this thing off me. And that was a relief. And then I saw that I had long pants on, but I could see that the blood wasn't pumping out. I mean, there was a lot of blood, but I, but it wasn't pumping out. And I and I don't know, I could see other things sticking out, which I didn't want to look at too carefully. Um, my manhood, that had disappeared. I, I thought, well, that's been ripped off, which wasn't something that pleased me either, that um, I did notice it. There wasn't much going on down there. Um, and then I asked, I got my gun belt and I just, I just asked, I think it was, my, you know, I asked Paul to use that. I just wrapped it around my, my thigh, my leg and used it as like a, as a tourniquet to just stop, control the, the loss of, the loss of blood. And, um, then it was a long wait. Uh, they tried to move me out, out of the thicket, but the pain was was exquisite, and and I just screamed uh, as they tried to lift me. I, I said, Maraji, you've got to you've got to get a car to me um, because I you can't I can't move." And so he ran off, and. Um, Got the the cruiser. That's a bit of a story because I just couldn't find the keys or something, but managed to get back. And um, I was astonished at the fact that I was. I felt like I, I've got enough going for me to survive this thing, but I wasn't sure how the hell I was going to get out of there. Anyway, they got back, and um, well, Maraji and the guys they got their pangas out, and they cut a sort of rode through the thicket and down to where I was lying. And um, lo and behold, I hear this air rushing and I, I thought, I don't want to, I don't want to believe it, but it was actually a puncture. Back, back left hand wheel, I think it was, I got a puncture. So now we got a puncture to change and it was quite, Weird, really. Oh, oh, Maraji, he was in such a state. This is a guy who's probably changed 3,000 flat tires in his, in his hunting career. He just couldn't get it right. He was, in, he was too, no, it was just too uh, unsettled by what was going on, I suppose. And um, he got it up and it fell off the jack. And I, so I actually had to now talk him through this whole process of changing a spare tire, which he, he could have done blindfolded. It was weird. I was lucky I didn't go into shock or anything. I managed to, you know, stay um, control of my bloody, of my senses. So we, um, I talked Maraji through the vent. We managed to get another t uh, spare tire on. And then they just heaved me up and lay me down on the back of the cruiser the, at the back, like a like a bloody dead animal there. Um, and and then we took off. We got back to camp. I don't know, it was after 12 o'clock, probably about one o'clock. And I, I, all I wanted at that point was morphine. And we had morphine, but Andy, my mate, had, uh, they'd had to take him back to Arusha to hospital, uh, to, or to a clinic or something there. And there was... There was the medics box had gone, so there was no relief from the pain, which was very disappointing. But you know, this was before cell phones. Um, in those days, we used to just have a, a radio sked in the evenings, really, to, to check in to the office. But other than that, we didn't have any, uh, you know, communications really that you, to speak of. Or, but we had our radio there, so I actually asked. I just got the. I spoke to the cook. I said, just get on that bloody radio and just put out an all stations call 
uh, to anybody who might pick up on that frequency that there's been an accident, my name, where I am. And I said, just tell anybody, if there, anybody hears the message, that I've gone to the mission. There was a, a mission station there called Simanjiro. It was Simanjiro. And there was an airstrip there that I knew about. So I said, just tell them I've gone there. And uh, if anybody picks it up, if somebody can come and help me. So it was really just a, a shot in the dark. I was very lucky. Um, it was a um, one of the hunting companies in Dar es Salaam. I think it was the Passanisi family who had their radio on. And somebody there heard the distress call and got hold of Arusha and one thing and another and got the uh, the word out that I that I was in trouble and if anybody could assist. My my great pal and sort of sparring partner at the time was a chap named Cliff Cameron, a mad New Zealander, pilot. Now uh, we'd had a lot of fun together. He he heard that um, what had happened and, and Cliff had a small charter company in, in Arusha. And his first response was, well, tell me if he's had his balls knocked off and then I'll go and collect the swine. Something to that effect, but he wasn't in any rush to come to my assistance for, for various reasons. We joked about it afterwards. But as it turned out, the, the call got to a US aid pilot, and I'm sorry to say, I don't remember his name. Uh, I need to get it, but he was in the area and I think it was part of a US aid program, I think, and they were delivering vaccine to the, the Maasai for their cattle. It was part of an agricultural support program. And he heard what had happened and he said, I'll go and see if I can find this guy. He was actually in the air. And I'll never forget lying in the back of this truck. I was in some shade, but it was hot. And there was a, a sort of clinic there. And this uh, African do doctor of sorts, I don't know, he was determined to do something to me. He wanted to either operate or stick an injection into me. He had a whole wad of these old, those old glass syringes. And they didn't look terribly clean. But now there was, there was a school there as well and all the school children had sort of crowded around and they were all looking at this bloody idiot lying in the back of this truck. And, the, and this guy jumped in he, and I don't know if he, he was barefoot and didn't look too much like a doctor. <laughs> but but he, ensured, he assured me he was. And then he could fix it, he could do everything. You know, he could sort me out. And I was saying, please man, just leave me alone. And I didn't want to be rude. I mean, he was trying to help me, but I, I was determined not to have him touch me because I could see one of those things going into me. It was probably, he, the syringe would probably kill me, not anything else. So I had a hard time <laughs> to, persuading this guy just to not, not to, uh, get, get involved with Were me. They, like those syringes, the, the with the stainless steel frame with the two rings and the glass tube. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he had, he had, you know, those tin bowls. It was full of these bloody things. There were four or five of them in there. And I don't know what was in them, but he wanted to stick everything he had into me. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was pleading for relief. And he was pissed off. And eventually he, he stormed off in a half. He said, you bugger you kind of thing and leapt out the back of the truck and stormed off to his, his clinic. But it was, I was really pleased to see him go. And, um, and then, you know, I thought, geez, now what? Because it's just nothing going on. And you wait, what, what happens now? I mean, there was nothing else I could do or anybody could do for me. And then I, I heard the chatter in Swahili and uh, there was something going on. And then I heard a noise, and lo and behold, it's an engine noise. But I didn't want to get my hopes up. And I thought, just I thought, geez, this can't be. Uh, don't don't get too excited. But it got closer, and then I could hear, and then I could hear these uh, kids talking about an or something. And 
Oh, then I, I heard his roar in the distance and I thought, geez, that is a bloody aeroplane. And lo and behold, in comes this, this wonderful American. Um, I think it was a 210, single engine. And uh, in he came and landed, uh, taxied up. And uh, we just got my toolbox out and took out all the... Um, seats on the whole side of the, there were three seats, I think, all those out. And then just maybe chucked me on the floor and he had some water and off we went. Me, with Paul still hanging onto my leg with that belt and off to Nairobi. Um, and I think in the playing, it got a bit much for me a couple of times. I, I seem to remember I lost consciousness a couple of times on the plane but all I was asking him to do was to please tell, ask him for some morphine when we got there because the pain was terrible. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget landing there. I remember the landing at, at, um, at I think, Nairobi International. And the plane taxiing up and the door opened and there was this African doctor in beautiful crisp, white coat with a big smile on his face and he said to me don't worry i've got what you want and he gave me this shot to morphine well then i was in heaven i mean they put me in this ambulance and took me off and i swear i thought i was in a discotheque um on the way to, to the hospital because they, they had a bloody siren going and lights going and everything and geez, I was happy as Larry uh, once that morphine uh, hit home. Anyway, we get get to the hospital, St. George's Hospital in, in Nairobi. Unbeknown to me, a friend of mine, a chap by the name of Bian, who uh, ex Rhodesian Air Force chap, who was flying, I think, for MK Airlines in those days. Uh, I've got to keep the story short, but it's but it's actually bloody funny because he had now landed his DC-8 or whatever it was at, there at in Nairobi, but being an old crotchety, well, older crotchety ex Rhodesian, he had an altercation with the air traffic controller um, about because he had to now pay something extra to get the the steps to the cockpit to get out the aeroplane. And he'd just been, he, I think he'd just been in Nigeria and he'd been ripped off there. And I was in Kenya and he was having a fight with the Kenyans. And he said, bugger this, I'm not paying you for um, whatever they wanted to send the steps. He, <coughs> he, he's now going to let himself and the crew out the plane with a rope. <laughs> so he's, he's, gets this rope and then he told one guy to bring a, a truck a panel van or something down below and he was gonna let they were gonna let themselves down on the rope onto the thing and then on onto the tarmac well i don't know what happened but he he lost his grip or something hit the tarmac and broke his leg a bad fracture so he is already he he'd got to the hospital before me so when I rocked up, I think he was already in the damn operating theater or something. They were going to start putting his leg together when, when I when I rolled in. But I was more, I was in I was in more trouble than he was. So I remember we were sort of we passed. I sort of looked at him. He was on a stretcher or on a on a bed, um, and I was on one. And we sort of he came out. And I was rolled in. We sort of looked at each other as we passed. I mean, it was almost surreal. And um, into the theater I went. And, um, yeah, they operated, I don't know, four, I think five, six hours or something, putting it all back together. My bladder was out. Um, the, the, the surgeon actually said one of the biggest problems he had was my, um, my, my intestines were full of sand 
So he'd had to take everything out and get a brush um, and soapy water and just clean, just to try and clean everything, get all the, all the rubbish out. The other slightly embarrassing um, <laughs> problem he had to face was my testicles. <laughs> this thing had hit me right uh, between the legs and those had gone quite high up. I don't know where they ended up, but he said he had a hell of a problem getting those things down again, back to where they, where they should be. Um, so yeah, anyway, I, uh, I woke up the next day, I suppose, and, and they said, you're, in, you're lucky, but we think we've put you all back, back together again. And uh, no, you, you, you've got a chance, you know, you just got to um, do what we tell you to do, which I was happy to do, but um, yeah, the pain the next four or five days was uh, excruciating. It wasn't easy, but I had my, my family, my mom, my sister, my dad all came up, Shane, uh, to see me and spend time and friends came and went. Uh, so that was, um, I made it. And, uh, and your, bi your bicep harness? Yeah, no, it was, it's fine. I was, it was all put together again. Um, oh, I don't know if you want to see it just yeah no it was all put together and it, everything everything seems to seems to have worked uh, I was I was ex extremely lucky I got um, I didn't get much um, sympathy put it that way from my from my colleagues the the initial report that went back to back to Harare, um, which was being circulated at Harare Sports Club and stuff was that um, the Buffalo story was actually a, a bullshit story, that I had actually been on a covert operation in Nairobi and I was in a taxi with a, with a prostitute and uh, <laughs> and we'd had a car accident and the prostitute had been killed and I was badly injured. But that was the official version of events. I think it was only when Andy went back to Zimbabwe that um, he said, no, shit, I'm telling you, this was my client and no, he's been hooked by a, a buffalo. Then the, the story was, yes, no, no it, it was a buffalo, but you know, he's He's so lazy, uh, the reason he got nailed was because I'd given my rifle to the tracker to carry. And so the, the buffalo made mincemeat of me and I didn't, it was my fault I didn't have a, a weapon to defend myself. So, so no, no peace for the wicked in this game. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's <coughs> shame. And this, that's an incredible story. I, I, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, no, it, uh, pleasure, John. Yeah, just, just one of many. And I, and I hope, uh, oh, no doubt, we can get some of my contemporaries and, and others to tell us their stories. There, uh, there are lots more of those out there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anis. Okay, John. Happy to talk. Cheers, man.